Oh. Hi. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm in the pharmaceutical business, and sure. Uh, yeah, and 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 I wanted to ask you what what are the the new trends that you see from from a service point of view, and if you have seen any best practices or something that we could bring to the pharmaceutical, like again, like CVS, etc., to to provide a word of mouth experience no because what what we want to do is bring it to the next level uh, i don't know yes. if I, I made myself clear i i, I get your question and uh, how can uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, improve on their service delivery uh and first of all the first question is who is your target uh part of uh, your work is to make sure you give service good service to the doctors because the doctors are the ones who are uh, mentioning the the uh, over-the-counter goods and also the uh, prescription goods that are necessary to solve the customer's treatment, to give a good treatment. So one will be doctors. Then the other would be to cre create a good con concept of service by for the customer buying a pharmaceutical product. Uh, so let's start with the doctors. Uh, what's happening there is... Uh, most pharmaceutical firms have very good salespeople who will uh, who want to promote some new product to the doctor, and they uh, therefore call the uh, um, the doctor's office and they get they set up an appointment to see the doctor. First of all, they're normally told the doctor won't be someone you can see because he or she is very busy. But please come over, bring a brochure about the new product, bring some sample of the new product, and uh, that would be, in our mind, a good service. Now, it's between us, uh, the best service would be is if they, they can really be there to work with the doctor and, and explain the product and, and offer good service. So uh, there's a problem there. Uh, which is universal, I believe. Now, as far as customers coming in to buy the product uh, off the shelf, uh, these are the non-prescribed products, the common, uh, you know, uh, products. Um, most people are not in, the service is not there because it's, it's self-service. Remember, the whole revolution in marketing went from uh, service be, by someone who is behind the desk you ask for the product, and uh, he or she goes and gets it for you. Well, we're in a world of self-service. Uh, so uh, no one, but the thing is, uh, if it were a prescri prescribed product, you do still have to give your, your name and birth date at pharmacies like CVS or Walgreen. Uh, the, so the pharmacy, um, is glad to take your order for a prescript, prescribed drug and then um, make it available by you coming over or it will be delivered to you. Now, people should be given a choice. Do I have to come every time for my new, uh, for my prescribed product or can you just ship it to me because I use it regularly, I run out of it regularly. Uh, and that's a, a decision of the company whether they should absorb the expense of bringing the sending the product to the customer or not. Uh, but in addition, there's the informational side. Now I've got the product. It looks a little scary. It looks, I don't know if I can swallow a pill that's that, that is that big, things like that. So companies have to imagine what kinds of questions uh, will come up when someone is given the product they just ordered uh what uh, they they may say i have four other products i'm using i'm wondering there's a bad interaction of the new product that i'm now supposed to have and the other four Be well that's a question for your doctor to answer so now it becomes a question of the doctor getting trained by your company your pharmaceutical firm to know that this question comes up about the mix of the new product with the other existing products. 
So I can go on for, for a long time, but basically um, the pharma company has to visualize who the target market is, the physician, maybe the nurse sometimes, and the customer, and also visualize for each one the kinds of problems that come up that might need a service response. So I won't go on beyond that, but thanks for your question, Nice to have you here. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, good thank luck you so in much. Bolivia. Can I ask you? Yeah, can, well, can, can, I, I, thank go ahead, you. Give me a quick Please. other question and I'll give you a quick yeah, answer. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. I, I I just wanted to 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 see if, if you got the 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 email uh and 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 that's it. I sent you yeah, the I'll write back if to you. you could... oh, okay, I will write thank back you, thank you. you. I did get it. Thank you. Okay, greetings from Bolivia. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kavier. Great. Uh, Lizelle, I see you with your hand up. Do you want to uh, unmute? Hello, Lizelle. Hi. Um, hi, Mr. Kotler and everybody uh, from South Africa. It's Liesl, the Yaga speaking. Um, yes, yeah, so my question is, um, I'm in charge of the marketing division for our company. But obviously, um, and not in charge of operations or sales, um, but we see all the complaints on service, delivery, and so on. What can the marketing division do to aid those divisions that we, you know, not being in charge of it, but what can we do to assist them to um, better, you know, get better service delivery? Thank you. Yeah, Lisel, that's a very uh, common situation of getting... Uh, some customers who are unhappy, and I would say this, a complaint is an opportunity. You start with that idea because it would be better, you might think it's better not to hear their problem, uh, but that's going to fester. Uh, no, it, it's your chance to show how good you are and responsive. Now, you're saying, but you're not the one who directly can connect, uh, uh, correct the situation. So that means that in your relationship to your subsidiaries who are actually doing the, uh, the, the work of uh, delivering a product and a service, they have not bought into high service because high, higher service is a higher cost. So they take a short view of the possibility that if they would take a long view and dedicate them to be special in service, better than their competitors are, they will they will benefit better. So I think your company, in working with the, the people who are actually at the level of delivering services, needs to give them a training program or an incentive to make, make service quality exciting to them. And that's about it. Yeah, thank you for your question. My battery's running low. Yeah. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Lizelle. And uh, I see that next the next question. I see uh, Jaken. Jaken, do you want to uh, ask? Oh, Jaken. Uh, yes. Jaken, we had you a second ago. Have you just you just vanished? He's okay. running low. Oh yeah, yeah. Jaken, here you are. Great. Hi, hello, Mr. Kotler. This is Jaken from India. Uh, Jaken, go ahead with your question. Nice to meet you. Likewise, thank you. So my question is, how do we identify the service that our consumers deserve versus the service that they're already being given? For example. Well, the, yes, yes. Well, uh, the answer is this, that uh, you, uh, any of your customers uh, can be asked, uh, are there any services you're getting now? What do you think of each of those services? What services would you like that company to add to, in its offering of services that is, is missing? And that kind of market research with your real customers is, is your hope of developing a situation where they never even have a problem with your firm because you've already managed to know what irks them or disappoints them. You're ready to correct that all the time. And it seems to me that you're without uh, an issue, a service issue. But as we saw a quotation earlier, 
service is a day in and day out business. And uh, one should not be casual about uh, the customer. And, and even if the service, you know, there will be some customers who are finicky. They, they, they bother you all the time about one thing and another. That's always raising the question of whether uh, you, you, they, they deserve to be your customer. But I, I, I'm not interested in the finicky customer, though you can learn a lot from that person. I'm interested in the average. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for the question. Who was it? Oh, uh, Augustine. Augustine, are you still here? You were, you were cut off. Yes, oh. here I am. Yeah, Augusta. Yes, right. Keep carry on from where you left off. Good, you're still here. Hi, Mr. Cutler. Well, my question was, how can we measure uh, our client satisfaction after our service, and how can have a great feedback to improve our service? Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Um, you know what you basically want to measure is customer satisfaction with your company and uh you have to prepare a set of uh, more specific questions you I, you know do you just send out a letter to your customer saying are you very satisfied somewhat satisfied not satisfied <laughs> and if the answer is not satisfied what are you not satisfied with i mean so basically do companies even get to that stage of taking the pulse of their customers. Now, here's the thing. I'm not asking you to do this for every customer. Um, you'll hear from those who are unhappy anyways, but you want a sample of the, from more or less your more important customers, because by the way, there's a rule sometimes called 2080 that um, your success is based as much on serving well, the top 20% of your customers who are there all the time for you. They're, they're your advocates. You hate to lose one who has been broadcasting you to the world that they're so happy with the service. By the way, if you're a company with no advocates, I mean, you have, they're, they're, they're semi-satisfied, then word of mouth is not gonna work from them. But the whole point is to get more than yourself as a company talking about the good things about the company. You want your best customers to be uh, freely and happily. You don't have to even pay them. They, they're glad to tell others, uh, oh, you're buying a new car. You can't go wrong with if you bought the X, you know. But uh, so your, your question is about measuring. Uh, so... Uh, to sampling your some set, some important set of your customers to make sure they're getting the job they expected. And um, I think you can imagine what the questionnaire looks like without asking any customer, but the best way to do it is, is to ask uh, some of your customers if they would uh, allow you to develop the best tool for knowing that they are satisfied. So, thank you. Michael, thank any you, other questions? Yeah, thank you, Gaston. Uh, Mariana, I see your hand up and you're next in line. So please ask your question. Okay, thanks so much, Mr. Kotler. It's an honor for me. I have a small healthcare company IT in Argentina. We have uh, our main competitors are multinational companies. We are very strong in all that have to do with uh, technical services but it's very hard for us to take advantage of it because our customer consider it as a basic thing that they have to do to make function their solution. So the point is, how can I do to, to take advantage of it? Well, I, I wanna understand uh, fully, uh, you're a technical company and, um, and I don't know the nature of the services, but you wanna be sure you're doing a good job could you be more specific about uh, maybe even an experience or an example? Yes, we commercialize a software that has to do with managing uh, all diagnostic imaging. 
in yeah. hospitals and diagnostical centers. The, this kind of software are like a commodity nowadays, and we are trying to work in hard in, have a, in having a, an excellent technical services. I see. So, but the point is that uh, our customers don't see it as a, as a good point, as an advantage. Say oh, that so the well, minimum. First, yeah, is the software occasionally an issue with some of your customers that they are trying to use it but not getting what they want from it? No, uh, they really don't have any problems. The, the solution oh, okay. is perfect. Perfect. Do, do you but, want them to you do you want them to change anything about the way they use your your software to even improve their uh, success? Yes, we make some um, specific um, capacity uh, capacitations and uh, workshops uh, to let them know how to use it properly, and we try to improve our technical area. To show yeah. them that we are really strong in what we and we really know what we what we do. Oh, so yes, that's wonderful. But are you really saying you're not getting good attendance at your training sessions? Uh, that they're not excited about the opportunity to learn more about how to use your software better? Yes, they they think that our technical services is something. It's a basic. A thing yeah. that they have to do to to make the solution works and for us yeah. it's a very good strong point because when we compare with our competitors we are really great and they told us that we are better than our competitors but we cannot take advantage of it yeah so you know it's interesting because uh it's very hard for a customer to switch software that they got used to Mm -hmm. um so it's not even your one of your the problems you might have is uh, you want to go after some new customers who are already stuck with some other software company and you there the job is how do you prove that by them switching they will get much more value than staying where they are mm -hmm. now that that's a, a tough one because uh People are, as long as, if you are reaching a person who's very satisfied with the competitor software, they're not gonna change. It's work to change. So uh, now, so you're, now you wanna be a growing company. So you've already gotten customers, many customers, but you'd like more of them. Well, maybe you should spend time watching for new firms that are coming up in Argentina, and mm -hmm. they yeah. are needing uh, some software. It's that point of decision making where, with, which where you either win or lose because they either knew you were one of the best companies for their new software or or not. So why don't you spend a lot of time in anticipating who is now starting up as a firm? and get into them quickly about your software as, as the best available. Thank you for your question. Thanks so much. Michael? Uh, Mariana, thank you very much for that. So I keep on keeping myself muted. Now I have a question I'd like just to slip in from the chat um, from Omid who says, um uh, doc, uh professor Cotter, what is customer equity uh discussed in uh one of your books um uh omid said he uh, found the concepts uh, slightly uh unclear and difficult to understand yeah equity could be used in a lot of ways um is you, do you know the expression uh, that a dei uh it's used to when a company wants to favor diversity. It, right. it, it doesn't want to only have a homogeneous group of uh, uh, workers and employees. It wants diversity. So it's DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Right. So what, what's the equity part when it's used in that sense? Um, uh, it's, it's that the person feels valued. 
mm. has, is of is of value. You know, if I could buy the person, I would do it because there's equity there. And now that is not a good explanation because I'd rather take the dictionary definition of equity because it is it is a term that is used in many ways. Um, often in, in the stock market too. I mean, it, it, you might say, is that stock of any substance? Uh, and, and it's sort of an equity question, but I, I'm, I'm gonna go and look up this uh, question better because we don't want words thrown out because they sound good. Do you need that word or not? Uh, and what is its function? Thank you for the question. I will examine that. Great. Uh, th thank you, Ahmed, for asking uh, that question. I appreciate it. it's very late, uh, early hours of the morning in your part of the world. Um, so our next hand up is Diana. Diana, would you like to ask a question, please? It would be an honor. Well, uh, my question is for, uh, about the particular client that uh, offers... Uh, it's actually a broker and it's based in Romania where uh, the narrative around financial services is quite negative. So the story that people tell themselves comes from the 90s. Uh, I will not go into details, but once uh, we reach this era, we choose to go, so we go from losing all our money, putting it in bad investments, we go all the way to crypto and other areas that seem a lot more interesting. What do you do when you are in a market where there's a bad narrative? Yes, of course. And uh, one of the markets that are very questionable often is the stock market or any set of investments Right now we have cryptocurrency, not just one called, uh, you know, one, but we have several types of that kind of currency. But here's the thing, uh, anyone who has the money to put into bonds or stocks uh, has to decide on a good ratio of bonds to stocks because bonds are usually fulfilled at the interest rate that they had been purchased for. Uh, but stocks uh, have no guarantee. Uh, and there's nothing better than a great stockbroker to being to advising you. Uh, how do you, if, as, as a person in the brokerage business, uh, convey the message that your recommendations are very reliable? For example, most people will ask this question. I'm interested in this in a certain stock. Is it a stock that I should buy? Or if I have it, should I hold it? Or if I have it, should I sell it? So the three ideas is always for any stock, buy, hold, or sell. Now, the, a company should get a reputation for that. The, the way they tend to get a reputation is they say that we've studied how many uh, brokerage firms or advisors say buy, how many have say, say hold and how many say sell. And having that information, we think you would be most comfortable holding anything that the market is saying it's, it's a good thing to hold or buy. Don't get into buying stock that the market thinks is a good sell. I mean, it's something to sell, uh, but, I think that um, uh, there's more firms now coming around offering um, a system. It's uh, one company that I know of has a system called Market Pulse. And for any stock, they can make a prediction whether it's good for selling, holding, or buying. So it seems that you actually, as, as a service provider for financial investment, you're going to win if you have a very convincing system for knowing the good stuff from the bad stuff and not leading anyone with conviction into buying something that turns out to be bad stuff. Uh, 
be more conservative in your recommendations of, of stock, not making uh, promises that, that you are ashamed of later on. But, but I, I, I think that's a very exciting business you're in that could go good or bad, depending on how your, your ethics and your, uh, your judgment work. Thank you. Thank you. Diana, thank you so much for your question. Uh, we have a hand up from uh, Murali. Murali, would you like to uh, ask the next question? Hello. <laughs> Hello. She can hear yeah. you. Uh, I'm Murali from India. Yes. Great. Your question? Murali, are you still with us? Maybe he wanted to say hello. Well, maybe that was <laughs> Which it. Which is fine. I, I, I like people from India to <laughs> ask questions. Murali, are you uh, are you are you there? What we do is you might just let um uh Eliana ask her question and come back to you. Eliana, why don't you ask your question and we'll come back to Marani. Uh, hello. Oh. oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. There are two Elenas. <laughs> oh, sorry. It was, uh, yeah, Eliana, yeah, we got you the second. You're the, the one in the queue next. So why don't you far away? <laughs> May I? Uh, or? Yes. We should... oh, thank you so much. Mr. Kondar, this is an honor to ask you this question first and foremost. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for organizing this uh, program in general. It's, uh, it's wonderful. So thank you so much for this insightful lectures. Um, my question is uh, related to the um, collecting feedback from uh, clients. Um, I will give you the case. Uh, I work in the regulatory technology company in Switzerland. So our uh, clients are financial institutions and uh, my target audience is actually um there are three target audiences there are decision makers there are there's a management of the banks uh there are compliance officers who actually use our solution and also front office relationship managers what i noticed is that of course both compliance managers and uh, relationship managers they are extremely busy they are overwhelmed with emails and even if we organize a webinar or something, I struggle collecting their feedback. And uh, the only effective way was so far is to physically ask them to fill out questionnaires at the end of the event. So I would organize an event and ask them to fill out um, the form. Am I overlooking something? Because I struggle, the, the attention span is uh, extremely short nowadays. So people don't want to spend their time on anything. And how would you suggest to uh, maybe collect yeah. the feedback? Well, you know, it's a common question. I first encountered that problem in another setting where you would want to be a company with uh, that has the marketing department and the sales force. And the marketing department is always interested in talking to the salespeople about how things are going and the salespeople say we're too busy mm -hmm. I, I i could be selling rather than answering your silly questions well so that's how i uh, i know what you're going through here you are uh, in a bank and uh, there are people who you need to know from them um how things are going and how things could be improved but they're so busy that uh you have to use a device like, well, at least can you fill out the, the, there's, this is only five questions I'm asking. And all you have to do is, I've even provided answers for each of the questions. So just check the, the one so you could do it in five seconds. Uh, well, so it is true uh, that there's a problem of, now the people are so busy that you're working with, uh, there may be a uh, there may be a lot of business loss because you need more people. There's, they're over busy, as is a possibility, uh, which means that I think your service level isn't probably very good. Um, they, if they're over busy for you, they're over busy. <laughs> Customers might try to reach them. 
but check on that as a possibility. Uh, it's a very common problem uh, with busy people that, um, you know, <clears throat> what you often do is what the pharmaceutical companies did. Doctors are busy people and they, I can't even get to see them. However, if I can take them to lunch, mm -hmm. I can find out a lot. So the question is, do you want to start uh, enticing uh, a few important uh, busy people uh, to a nice uh, situation like having a quick breakfast or lunch or something, and then you'll get a lot of value out of that if it's legal to do, you know. In pharmaceutical work, by the way, which you're not into, uh, you can't uh, enter. You can't take the clients to lunch or or dinner. Oh. So, good good question. Great, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And, uh, that was great. And we can try again with uh, uh, Murali. Murali, you are you there? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, from India. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sorry. 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 I got dropped. Uh, I am from automotive background. Uh, my question is about EVs. So today the differentiation is only the EV charging and mileage. So once everybody achieves same, what can be the service differentiator in future for automotive yeah, EVs? Yeah. Industry? Let me understand. Did you say you're in the what business are you in? Uh, uh, we are into automotive uh, uh, car automobile. Uh, your, your, your company sells automobiles? No, we are the uh, tier one. We manufacture automotive parts and supply to OEMs. Oh, oh you, you manu manufacture parts for automobiles, right? Yeah, yes, yes. And the, that means the parts are available at dealerships, right? Someone uh, bought a car? Uh, yeah. Or can they be ordered, can they be ordered anyways? No, it will be directly supplied to OEM, automotive manufacturers. Oh, the original equipment, OEM is original equipment manufacturer. Correct. And, okay, uh, so let's say you represent a company that makes a car and all the parts in a car and so on. So exactly. what is the issue? See, uh, to, uh, the, uh, in EVs, what will be the service differentiator in future? Oh, you want to be very good at supplying the companies who bought your cars and, and parts to be sure that they can place orders and get almost immediate delivery. Okay. So so the point is you, you must have, did you make a promise of how fast things will be fulfilled that are needed? You know, anyone who has a car that's missing a part is very unhappy and they want to know that the parts in the United States, where I am, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, BMW cars, which really means that I hesitate from buying a BMW because when a part goes wrong, it may not be in stock in the United States. It could be uh, in Europe, and I'd have a long wait. But that only uh, emphasizes the importance of, uh, of, of service. You're absolutely right. Uh, and do you want to make any promise that typical missing parts, not uh, very rare missing parts, are going to be uh, available that you're that when you buy a car, mention how important it is, important it is, and how outstanding your company is in in a great record of supplying parts when they have to be replaced. I mean, I don't know what kind of campaign you should be running because you want to sell more cars. So you also want to say we are the best company for parts and service after the car is bought. Now, is there a metaphor? You know, remember with the cigarettes, uh, the Marlboro people had a kind of image, uh, the company, of, of the uh, the cigarette that makes you into a cowboy, basically. Now, what kind of metaphor or imagery can be dramatic enough to excite uh, a belief that uh, your cars are 
regularly uh, supplied with every part necessary in case anything goes wrong. I won't say more than that, but that's that's the issue, and and there may be some answers to that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Cortley. Yeah. Uh, uh, Morali, thank you very much uh, for your Michael. Question. Do we have just a few more questions? Because I think I've answered yeah. a number. Yep. Yeah, yeah. How do should we stand? We, should we do two more? Is that okay? Two or? more would be fine. Right. So I'll take one from the ch the chat. Um, and then I'll come to Shamim. So we one in the chat uh, uh, says, hello, Mr. Kotlev. This is from uh, Sheila. Um, we're noticing a shift in mainstream media nowadays. There aren't those media audience audiences or prime time slots anymore. Instead, it's all about a scattered and dispersed media scene. We're also seeing influencers on the rise and social networks getting more crowded. Do you think influencers are going to be the big players for brands in the future? How do you see brands being built and growing in the future? Yes, uh, and maybe brands are going to be suffering in the future from uh, other conditions that distract us from paying as much attention on brand to brands as as they used to be. Uh, there's, I mean, I've seen literature now suggesting less interest in the brand, more interest in other sources of influence. But mm -hmm. you didn't ask that. You asked, what can you do to keep making your brand stronger and stronger? Well, <laughs> let's go to the question of influencers, which you raised. Uh, you know, if you can get Taylor Swift, the singer, to be shown with a certain purse made by uh, Dion or something, some famous company, uh, she will sell for that company so many ma more purses. Um, but you're not going to pay Taylor Swift to do it, and she wouldn't do it that way. Uh, she, so, but now there's, we're finding out that more, many people have followers, and they range from uh, some people with 10,000 followers to 100,000 and so on. So, and then some followers are getting to be aggressive, you know, they say, they even approach the company and say, I'd like to be an influencer for you and I'll do it. I, I have, I can mention your product and, and talk how, how, how beautiful it is, uh, but I need to be paid for that. Mm -hmm. So companies in some cases are doing that. They are actually moving into uh, uh, paying some big influencers and of course it means that they've had a, a system to know actually how much that influence was maybe the many of the sales would have taken place without that influencer anyways so you know you don't want to overpay influencers and some companies don't want to even pay anyone for influence but uh yeah now the the way it used to work is we would always uh, be a company that wanted to have a celebrity who would talk about us. They would be, um, uh, and we just hope that they don't get scandal in any way that, because they become, we pay them handsomely to be an obvious influencer, not a secret influencer. And uh, then we find out they are having a divorce or they uh, did something shameful and your whole business can collapse. You know, you you choose a football hero or someone else, and things got to be careful of managing. So, the, does influencers uh, build the brand? Yes, as long as they don't get scandalized themselves. Uh, but there are other sources of influence on a brand. Sometimes an image itself. You remember, I just mentioned earlier, Marlboro cigarettes. I mean, what's that? Well, that brilliant. How do you come up with a brilliant idea to make people feel like they're cowboys by smoking that brand. I mean, uh, if you're a pharmaceutical firm, you're not gonna get doctors to think of themselves as cowboys just because they're gonna recommend, you know. So that's a, a big problem. I've written an interesting book on branding. It's called, uh, you'll look it up in, in the Amazon and, and we're in, it's called brand activism, brand activism. And it means that the brand is more than just telling what's good about the product. It's telling what's good about the company. The company cares about the things the target customer cares about. That's enough. 
-hmm. that that you're a caring company and you even show it by the way you handle the water shortage problem or the climate issue and the pollution issue problem. You have a set of values. So what builds the brand is more than just the performance of your specific product. It's it's the value system of your company. Okay. Great. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that um, uh, answer. Uh, and I hope uh, um, uh, the guys uh, found that illuminating. Uh, and as uh, promised, one final question. I see Shamim, your your hand is up. Would you like to ask? Yeah. Hello, sir. Um, I'm from Bangladesh, uh, just next to India. Oh, I've been to Bangladesh and I, I had a great experience there. Thank you. I was present in that seminar. Uh, you probably remember Dr. Anwar. <laughs> okay, good. In fact, I was... Uh, Kind of younger, and I was like aspiring marketeer. So, so <laughs> honor and listen. One of the things is, is I would say, pay a lot of attention to your hero, who is uh, my hero too. And I'm talking about uh, the one who won the Nobel Prize. Oh, uh, Dr. Yes, and he has a thing. He says he wants a three zero. Uh, he wants a zero economy, and he names three zeros. Uh, yeah. Zero unemployment, uh, zero pollution, uh, and uh, I forget all three, but it's a brilliant idea that uh, he wants a zero economy. Look, look it up, okay? Uh, yeah. So again, so it's a great honor, and uh, I'm a general manager in a healthcare company, but I also support our uh, agricultural system. I'm, I, I am a part of a startup, everything yeah. tech. So, sir, you taught us the you know, taught the world. Um, I always tell my team, get the basics right. You know, <laughs> you see a learning Thank curve, you. let alone seven P. So again, sir. So uh, well, now I'm on. Now I'm on to seven, but they're not all P's. Yeah. Actually, the three, the three that I added was uh, instead of just saying price alone, you're always setting incentives. You know, like buy now, and I'll reduce the price by ten percent. So incentives and price. And then for product, I want you to add service as a separate but related thing. Uh, and so those are two more. So I've already given a lecture on the new marketing mix is not four piece, it's seven piece. Yeah. So I'm glad that you're 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 on to that too. Thank you, sir. Well, listen, I, if I ever get back there, I'll say hello to you. That's uh, um, interesting yeah. things. And I do know agriculture. Your two businesses that are so important is agriculture and textiles and so on. And I'm sure there's more going on now, too. Take you're care. Probably, uh, yeah. You're probably wearing a shirt from Bangladesh. You have to check. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. I'll Great. be. I'll be Okay, we're now we're we're running over time, as I understand, um, and I think we should uh, wrap up there, um, if that's all right, uh, and um, say a huge thank you to you, Mr. Kotler, for being with us uh, today, and hugely inspiring everybody. Um, whilst you were absent uh, for a short minute, uh, Melvi, who's one of our regulars. Uh, said that whenever she listens to you, you nail all the answers in just a few words, when sometimes she has to listen to whole lectures from other people uh, <laughs> to, get, to get the answer. Uh, so she's very, very um, uh, happy. Um, so yes, that wraps up our session uh, for uh, today and for this afternoon, and maybe this morning or maybe um, night, depending on where you are uh, in the world. Um, and it's been a great privilege uh, to listen to you, Mr. Kotler, uh, answering questions uh, and inspiring us with uh, very interesting thoughts on service uh, today. Very, very important and very crucial. Um, so, I wish you. So all... I'll, say good... I'll say goodbye then. Uh, th thanks again, Michael. And uh, in a month from now, I'll again, and I'll choose a very different, important marketing subject for that talk. Great. And we're all looking forward to it very much. Um, and in the meantime, everyone have a very wonderful uh, rest of the weekend. Um, and uh, so good night, good morning, good evening, good afternoon.